Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Sean Scott. I'm currently serving as the Associate Director of the Association of American Law Schools. I'm also a tenured professor at Loyola Law School, Los Angeles. Faculty candidates who are invited um, for a full day interview at a law school will be expected to make about a one hour presentation to the faculty on the topic of the candidate's choice. This is commonly referred to as a job talk. Today's presentation is a mock job talk. I emphasize the word mock. It has been staged and scripted, but we will do our best to simulate the experience of giving a job talk as part of the faculty recruitment process. <clears throat> so we will try to present uh, some of the more challenging situations that a faculty candidate may encounter during a job talk. Um, it is a simulation, and so uh, the questions and answers are designed specifically to present uncomfortable or awkward situations that may occur during a job talk. Uh, that's because primarily we're trying to use this as a teaching tool. Um, and so you need to know what goes well and what might not go so well, and we'll hope to give you some strategies for managing those, uh, those difficult situations. So after the presentation, we will do a debrief and uh, talk about some of those uncomfortable situations and present some strategies. So with that, I will turn it over to Professor Hammond. Good afternoon. Today we are fortunate to have with us Kate Weisbird, who is currently a lecturer at Berkeley Law, where she is the founder and director of the Youth Defender Clinic there at Berkeley Law. Um, you have her CV in front of you, but um, I'll just highlight that she's a graduate of Columbia Law School. Um, she clerked for Judge Carlton at the Eastern District of California, um, and she has also been an investigator for death penalty cases uh, for the Southern Center for Human Rights in Atlanta, Georgia, um, among many other accomplishments. So without further ado, please help me welcome Kate Weisberg. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for having me here today to talk about my paper, Sentence to Surveillance, um, which focuses on how consensual electronic surveillance is redefining non-carceral punishment in the United States. So I want to start by asking you to imagine something. Imagine if right now someone came up to you and they took your cell phone or your laptop and they looked at literally everything on it every um, email, every text message, every Facebook post, every bank transaction, every photo, um, every prescription refill. Imagine further that that person had the password to your um, laptop or your cell phone or your email or your social media accounts. And imagine further that that person had the authority to have you jailed based on what they found on your cell phone or on your laptop. This is increasingly the common experience for people on probation and parole and other forms of community supervision. In state and federal courts across the country, defendants are being required to consent to warrantless searches of all of their electronic devices and data. In juvenile court, for example, where I practiced, children on probation are ordered to provide to their probation officer the passwords to their email and social media accounts. To make this concrete, my only slide today shows you the language commonly used in federal plea offers in the Northern District of California. Let me just get to that slide. Here we go. Okay. So here's what it says. The defendant shall submit his person, residence, office vehicle, electronic devices, and their data Self, including cell phones, computers, and electronic storage media, and any property under the defendant's control to a search. Such search shall be conducted by a United States probation officer or any federal, state, or local law enforcement officer at any time with or without suspicion. And I'll keep this slide up so you can refer back to it during the course of my presentation. So it's my position that this type of invasive, broad surveillance has created the potential for an electronic panopticon of really unprecedented proportion. So in my paper, I examine this practice in its own right, and also because it reveals two fundamental shifts in criminal justice that I think are worth discussing. 
First, these electronic search conditions show how the sort of rehabilitative and benevolent rhetoric of probation and parole mask the distortive effect of surveillance technology. And second, these search conditions demonstrate in many ways the dangers of relying on consent to justify increasingly invasive privacy intrusions. In many ways, relying on consent imposes an increasingly invasive, uh, in, in many ways, this sort of consent uh, to, to increasingly invasive searches offers a kind of cautionary, if not slightly dystopic tale about what happens when advancements in technology outpace Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. So over the next few minutes, I'll explain how we got to this point and why these search conditions are unprecedented, both in their scope and in their justification. I'll then highlight three underappreciated risks that flow from warrantless searches. And finally, I'll suggest the beginning of a new framework to use uh, moving forward. So let me begin by describing how we got here and why these electronic search conditions represent truly uncharted territory. So as a descriptive matter, we are witnessing two tectonic shifts in Fourth Amendment jurisprudence that are really moving sort of in opposite directions. On the one hand, we have state legislatures and the rarely united Supreme Court consistently um, taking a, the, a hardline position on limiting government surveillance of private data. We've seen this most strikingly in the court's recent decision in Riley and Carpenter, cases in which the Supreme Court limited warrantless searches of cell phones and cell phone data. But on the other hand, the privacy rights for those on community supervision have been consistently eroded over the years. Although people on probation parole have always existed in sort of this legal gray area, they're neither fully free nor fully in custody, they do retain privacy rights, even if diminished. Historically, courts have upheld probation parole searches under the special needs doctrine, which balances the privacy intrusion on the one hand versus the government interest in the search on the other hand. However, in the context of electronic searches, perhaps because the privacy intrusion is so great, courts are relying less on this special needs doctrine, and instead they're relying more increasingly on consent. And in fact, I don't think it's clear that a blanket and broad electronic search would actually survive if analyzed under the special needs doctrine. And I'm happy to say more about that in the Q&A. What these diverging shifts mean is that people on probation and parole are not afforded any of the protections articulated in Riley or Carpenter or related state legislation that limits government surveillance. As in other areas of criminal law, consent means that the Fourth Amendment analysis is avoided, is sidestepped. And in my paper, I make the case that these electronic searches represent an unprecedented privacy intrusion. In a typical probation search of a defendant's house, the defendant sees when a police officer or probation officer is rifling through his or her things. And the search lasts for only as long as the police or probation officer has that day. It is a physical impossibility, really, for police to conduct constant and perpetual physical searches. But electronic searches, on the other hand, are invisible and have no such natural limits. Um, with the click of a mouse, a probation officer can monitor the content of a defendant's email, social media account, at any time without the defendant even knowing. And this lack of natural limits is what makes these searches so novel. In many ways, people on probation and parole are in the eye of a perfect legal storm. The amount of private and intimate data stored on electronic devices combined with increased reliance on consent and consensual surveillance has created what I think is a true privacy crisis. It's a crisis because consent taken to its logical extreme could justify any condition no matter how unconscionable. It's essentially a limitless limit. It's also a crisis because probation parole is now the most for common form of punishment in the United States. There are more than 5 million people on community supervision. Although courts and scholars have rightfully interrogated the use of surveillance technology in the context of policing, there's been virtually no attention paid to how consensual electronic surveillance is redefining the contours of non-carceral punishment. And with that, I look forward to your questions and feedback. Thank you.
Yes. Um, so thank you for taking the time to present to us. I really like this paper a lot. Um, one thing that I found troubling, though, was I wasn't sure if you did enough of a job of taking into account what the alternative is, right? So if you're incarcerated, you have zero privacy. Um, and if this system and all these tools help let us keep fewer people in jail and more people out enjoying at least some freedom, um, don't we need to be talking in relative terms? Right. So I think this is a, a really important question. And it's a very fair question because I think that it gets at this idea of, you know, are you really, am I arguing for um, eliminating a choice? Um, and I can see that for some people in some situations, it definitely is better to be not incarcerated and monitored than incarcerated. Um, but there are two important, though not obvious, concerns that I have. One is that we so so we assume there's a choice, and that being incarcerated is always worse than being free. Um, but first, we assume that this choice is there, and it's a sort of a choice between two equals. But oftentimes, there is no choice. Oftentimes, people in the criminal justice system. Um, go between two statuses, namely being out on probation, some form of community supervision, and then in custody. Um, and it's often not a quid pro quo exchange. So it's not like people choose, do I want to have one day of being intensely supervised on probation versus one day in prison? Um, often, oftentimes, it's not a quid pro quo exchange like that at all. It's much more time being supervised than they would spend otherwise in prison. Um, and oftentimes, it's not an either or. It's really, most often, both. Both people spend time in both statuses. Um, second, I think it's, it's, we assume that being free is always better, but I'm not sure that's necessarily true, depending on the invasiveness of the surveillance. Um, and it's also there, true that there's no empirical evidence yet suggesting that this type of electronic surveillance prevents recidivism and therefore prevents people from going back into custody and the sort of revolving door that has been very well documented in the criminal justice system. Um, finally, even if people can make informed and real decisions, um, I'm not sure we can say a choice is real when it's that coerced. In other words, when people are told that they either have to agree to an electronic search condition or be incarcerated, um, I'm not sure that's a real decision that people can make free of coercion. Thank you. Yes. Don't we all have diminished expectations of privacy these days? There's stories uh, in the paper um, often about uh, facial recognition technology. So you're out on the street, you, know, you think that nobody's watching you, but in fact, the government has some cameras there that are tracking you and that can identify you and indicate what you've done. And the same thing, I think, uh, uh, occurs online where you've got Google, Amazon, other providers who are sort of looking over and screening what you've done. Uh, don't these diminished expectations of privacy give lesser persuasion to an argument that people on probation should be exempt from the kind of intensive scrutiny that you're talking about? Absolutely. You know, I, I think this is a very important point, too, because, you know, as a descriptive matter, what you're saying is, of course, true. I mean, for all we know, you know, the NSA is listening to this job talk right now. Uh, we don't know. Um, but, but, um, but even if we do share lots of personal information online all the time, um, that doesn't mean we don't also care about privacy. So as a doctrinal matter, these electronic searches definitely implicate the third party doctrine. Um, historically, if you share information with a third party, you assume the risk that it won't be kept private. And yet the third party doctrine is really no longer workable in light of advancements in technology. Um, the poor fit between the third party doctrine and technology was most vividly revealed uh, recently in the Supreme Court's decision in Carpenter, where the court found that the third party doctrine did not apply to historic cell phone location data, data that would otherwise be sort of public data, um, the court said, no, there's still privacy interest there, even though it's been revealed openly to the public. Um, so yes, we share information, and we share lots of information, lots of private information, but that doesn't mean we don't have a privacy interest in that information. Um, and then, you know, as a normative matter, just because people share information online, on Google, on Amazon, uh, doesn't mean that they don't also care about privacy. Um, just because we share stuff publicly doesn't mean we don't care about the government sort of snooping around and watching what we're doing. Um, concerns about government surveillance is what prompted California to pass the expansive Electronic Communications Privacy Act. And these exact concerns um, also animated the court's decisions in Riley, Jones, and, and Carpenter. So I do think that even when we share information publicly, that doesn't mean that we don't also have 
true privacy concerns. Yes. So I'm still struggling with this point that for a lot of these people in community supervision, the alternative is incarceration, right? And I'm not a criminal law expert. My understanding, though, is that uh, judges have a wide amount of discretion in terms of fashioning conditions of probation, for example. And if your proposal is to sort of uh, create limits on those types of restrictions, won't the response be just to give the maximum sentence uh, if, if the judge fears that the person might reoffend or something like that? Right. So I think that part of this, again, assumes, though, that, that, that there are two equal alternatives. And oftentimes, people are sentenced to both a period of incarceration and a period of being on supervised release. So it's not really a question of either or. So that's one thought I have about this very important question. But the other thought, too, is that um, we assume that, um, that, that courts, that judges would um, lock people up if they didn't have this ability. But of course, the most important question is, in a world without these electronic surveillances, surveillance op options, what would the sentence be? And this is where you know I talk a little bit in my paper about um, the unconstitutional conditions doctrine, which is to say the real question we need to be asking is, in a world without these the ability to monitor people this way, would court still impose the sentence? And I think the answer is no. That being said, there's not empirical evidence about this, and that's certainly work I want to do in future projects. Yes. Um, thank you um, for your talk. Um, I'm not really a criminal law expert either, but I do um, spend a lot of time thinking about ways to constrain the government short of the Constitution. And one of the ways might be something like government contracts, mm. of putting limits on um, the extent of government power or the scope of searching, um, or even having provided devices that have certain limits on them. And so I just wonder if you could say a few words about um, other ways to constrain these government actors, um, maybe that, that, that fall short of constitutional Right, so this is really, the area of um, government contracts is a super important literature that I have yet to fully explore or take advantage of in my work, um, because I do think that government contracts and sort of government, um, the ways in which um, we can constrain that is, is really important and can shed some light onto some of these problems. Um, you know, there's a huge private industry interest in a lot of this electronic surveillance, and so understanding sort of... Um, ways in which you know local jurisdictions and municipalities uh, use rely on government contracts is super is really important um, but i haven't yet done that and i hope to in in future work is to draw on that literature so thank you yes so i haven't had a chance to read your paper and i don't teach criminal law but um one of the things that occurs to me is you're making an assumption about um the, the reason that we punish and the reason that we incarcerate is to discourage people from committing the crime again. But what if that isn't the underlying theory of punishment? What happens to your paper? Well, so I don't think my paper necessarily depends on sort of a retributist theory of punishment. Um, certainly, I think there's an argument to be made that that is one of the theories of punishment on which probation and parole is based. But one of the things that I think is so interesting is that probation and parole is often justified on rehabilitative grounds and on, on sort of more benevolent grounds, quite frankly. And so, so I do think that um, even if we, uh, if we take out of the equation sort of the more punitive um, goals of the criminal justice system and instead just look at it from the perspective of probation parole is meant to rehabilitate people um, and to help with reintegration in the community, the question then becomes, does this increased amount of surveillance further that interest or undermine that interest? And in my paper, I make the point that it undermines this because it undermines the rehabilitative um, goals of probation and parole because it actually increases, may increase recidivism as, instead of diminishing recidivism. Yes. Um, is this maybe a story not of necessarily expansion, but instead of refocusing or reorientation? By which I mean, like I do all of my shopping now pretty much on Amazon, right? I don't physically go to stores anymore. And when you think about things like bullying and harassment, you know, a lot of that's happening in online spaces. So I guess my, my question is, do you think that the evolution of these tools is more just a response to the fact that we're all living online now? So the surveillance has to live online. 
Right. I think this is, um, there's no question that thanks to technology, you know, we are all living so much of our lives online. And quite truthfully, thanks to technology, we could also have perfect crime detection if that's in fact what we wanted. Um, so the real question is at what cost? I mean, the police could put GoPro cameras in all of our houses and in every office and in public, every public space. Um, but with that level of surveillance, I think that most people would say that the price of perfect crime detection comes at too high a cost. Um, and in the context of probation parole, my position is that these electronic searches come at too high a cost, uh, too high a price. We value privacy for a reason. And while people on probation parole definitely have diminished expectations of privacy, that doesn't mean they have no privacy. And I fear that these search conditions mean just that. Um, and let me be clear, I'm not taking the position that there should never be electronic searches or electronic surveillance. My position is only that the intrusion, the privacy intrusion, should be narrow and be in furtherance of the goals of probation parole, and further, that we shouldn't rely on consent to get us there, that instead we should be relying on the special needs doctrine, which then allows us to have these really hard but important conversations about privacy intrusion and how much privacy intrusion we are willing to allow in light of people being on probation and parole. Yes. So let me come back to consent. You were just mentioning. Yes. Isn't it true that people consent to searches all the time under much more more coercive circumstances than what we're talking about here? And and so I don't. I guess I wonder why is consent so bad in this setting when we tolerate it um, in such much more extreme circumstances in other scenarios? Right. So, you know, there's plenty of criminal procedure scholars talking about and problematizing uh, coercion and consent. Um, and, and, and I think that there is still, though, a gap in the literature um, when it comes to uh, consent in the, with respect to electronic surveillance. And I hope that my paper adds two points to this sort of general concern about consent, which is that um, first, unlike other forms of consent in criminal procedure, here, if a defendant doesn't agree to the um, consent, um, the alternative is prison. So this is in contrast to, say, Miranda or a consensual bag search on the street. Um, people give up their rights all the time because they think they can get something out of it. But we'd have a problem if, say, someone on the street um, refused to allow the police to search their bag, so they didn't consent to the search, and that the police then, by law, were allowed to incarcerate them. We would, I think, have a, have a real problem with that, um, and certainly isn't the law. Um, and in the, search, in the case of search conditions, that's exactly what's happening. Um, conditioning freedom on accepting an invasive electronic search is coercive if the defendant would have otherwise been entitled to probation without that form of electronic search. Um, second, defendants, I mean, frankly, just like all of us, um, don't necessarily understand the privacy rights they're giving up when they agree to or consent to an electronic search. It's one thing to agree to have a police officer search your bag. You can see when it's happening. You can see when it's over. You presumably know what's in the bag. But that's not the case with electronic searches. Um, electronic searches are broader, they're more invisible, there's no natural limit, and it's hard to appreciate what's at stake when bargaining over informational privacy. And that's how I think consent is different in this context. Yes? Given that consent is critical to whether or not the government has uh, violated uh, Fourth Amendment rights, um, should we regard uh, Plea bargaining is, in, is sufficiently co inherently coercive that there can't be consent in that context to uh, uh, electronic surveillance? So plea bargaining, we have a lot to learn from plea, bar plea bargaining. And, and I rely very much so on the very robust literature around plea bargaining in my paper. And I frankly hope to do more in future projects. One of the things that's so interesting, though, is plea bargaining has rightfully sort of been um, interrogated for its coercive nature. But what has been not, what hasn't been asked yet is how does that same analysis of coercion apply in contexts that are similar to the plea agreement context, but not the plea agreement context? So, for example, agreeing to electronic searches 
um, or agreeing to say we're an ankle a GPS ankle monitor. Um, I think they have we we are seeing similar coercive concerns in these other contexts, but we haven't the literature has yet to sort of discuss how the um, concerns with coercion in the plea agreement, plea bargaining process apply in these other contexts. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping to do. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Weisberg for uh, presenting today. A special thanks to George Washington University Law School for hosting us. We very much appreciate the faculty turnout and your participation. For more information about the faculty hiring process, please go to our website at aals.org. Thanks. <laughs>